Okay, thank you very much everybody for uh, inviting me today. It is a pleasure to be in Riga. And I'm here to talk to you about the cheerful topic of how to kill Bitcoin because we need more people to talk about Bitcoin dying. This is the one thing missing from the Bitcoin brand. So here we are. Now, of course, people generally have all kinds of vivid scenarios about how Bitcoin eventually dies. And, you know, government will ban it, government will stop it, or hackers will take it down. These are the sort of initial reactions that people generally have about Bitcoin. And these things can generally work um, in, and can have an effect, but it's not really clear that these things can actually kill Bitcoin off completely. And, um, you know, I'm not going to get into detail about the different kinds of technical and political attacks that are possible against Bitcoin, but I want to focus on the deep um, underlying economic reason why they generally fail at killing Bitcoin or why they could fail at uh, killing Bitcoin. And that's because Bitcoin is apolitical and uncensorable money. And therefore, any government controls or censorship against Bitcoin will simply advertise Bitcoin's value proposition. And so Bitcoin is telling you this is money the government can't control. And every time the government tries to control your money by telling you don't um, use Bitcoin, the government is just telling you we control your money and that even if, you know, not directly, indirectly puts you in the frame of mind of thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have some form of money that the government doesn't control? And so um, these kinds of attacks foster the economic incentive for Bitcoin's success, essentially. And if they attack Bitcoin and they fail to cut it completely, then these kinds of attacks advertise its resilience. And therefore, governments become, you know, you could think that it's more wise, it's wiser to accept Bitcoin than to try and kill it and fail. And more generally, I would recommend looking at this great book, 40 Centuries of Wage and Price Controls, on attempts by government to try and ban um, or regulate the prices of different things and how the market has always gone around government and always, uh, uh, governments have always failed at fighting prices. And you know, here uh, in Eastern Europe, in the Soviet Union, we had a very vivid example of what happens when governments try to find uh, prices. Government controls do not override human incentives. They simply, they simply change the costs and people find a way to get what they want. Society is ultimately stronger than the state because you know people have bonds with um, friends and family that are stronger than the control of the state and through these bonds people are able to get around these kinds of controls and eventually all kinds of economic restrictions fail because they fail to attack at economic incentives. And so, you know, today we can see this example with drugs. And the U.S. fights an enormous war on drugs. Thousands of people die every year uh, in Mexico because of the war on drugs. And drugs are more space intensive and more conspicuous than um, Bitcoin. And still, they're still available in places where they are illegal. And, you know, we see black markets emerge. And we see this with Bitcoin already. Um, you know, people here have spoken about all kinds of different innovations that are being introduced into Bitcoin. We see many layers of redundancy. And we see how um, any kind of restriction will only simply lead to more innovation. And we see people coming up with things like mesh networks and radio and all of the innovations we, we see with Bitcoin hardware and software. Essentially, the more... Um, government controls and government attacks that are on Bitcoin, the more innovation you will see of people trying to get around them. And effectively, the more ingenious people will become in trying to fight them. And that's really the real problem with these attacks on Bitcoin. And that's why, you know, the technical attacks, in a sense, miss the fact that the defenders or the Bitcoiners can can think of ways to react to any particular ban and to get around it, as markets always do throughout history. And so this then, in cent for me, suggests that um, the, 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 as long as the economic incentive to use Bitcoin exists, then people will do their best to use Bitcoin. And on the other hand, we see that the worse th uh, the money is, the people will be driven more and more towards uh, using uh, Bitcoin. So. Governments, they can't dictate economic reality. They can't just force people away from Bitcoin. But they can influence it through the, their choice of the monetary and financial and banking system and services that they offer to their people. Effectively, they can either amplify the economic incentive to use Bitcoin through 
placing restrictions on uh, money transfer and on banking and um, through engaging in inflation, or they can weaken it through doing the opposite. In other words, in other, rather than trying to stop people from using Bitcoin, governments, if they really wanted to kill Bitcoin, they should really think about eliminating the economic incentive that people have to use Bitcoin. How do you do that? Well, you improve your monetary and financial policies to the point where Bitcoin isn't needed. If you do that, you take away the incentive that people have for using Bitcoin. And so the better the monetary and the financial policies, the less the incentive have, people have for using Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin becomes easier to kill, perhaps. So here is one attack vector that I would like to present to you. It's from the old history books, something called the International Gold Standard. It's like the, gold, it's like the Bitcoin standard, but you know, it's ancient. It's the original centralized alternative to statist central banking. And you know, it's not exactly like Bitcoin, but for a period between 1870 and about 1914, when this was the dominant monetary system in the world, it worked wonderfully. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. There was no hyperinflation recorded anywhere. Price inflation or the increase in prices was around 0% per year. Sometimes it was negative 1, sometimes it was negative 2, sometimes it was plus 1, plus 2. Basically, it's a meaningless metric anyway. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything, but effectively back then, prices didn't really rise. There was no real inflation. Um, there was very little business cycles unless the government started interfering with the central bank. People had much more uh, individual freedom. There was far less of a nanny state. There was no surveillance state in that time. And you have to, uh, and for me, of course, you have to draw the link between all of those things and the monetary system because it is because of the monetary system that all of these um, uh, agents of the agencies of the state are able to carry out all of this level of control. In terms of wars, you know, this was a period of peace and limited war because governments being financed by uh, gold means that they can't just print money to fight wars. And in terms of Drugs, you know, think about it back then, there was simply, it was unheard of anyway that there would be a war on drugs. Drugs were just, you know, they were frowned upon socially and people didn't use them in public and people who used them were ostracized, but they were still legal. You could go and buy drugs from a pharmacy and it was not something that you could go to jail for. And there was no income tax and so there was no financial reporting on everything. You didn't have to report all of your income on everything to the government, you didn't have to hand out all of your information to your local bank and government so that all of your local criminals will eventually hack into it and know everything about you. These things didn't exist. Your relationship with your bank was just your relationship with the bank and you know, the relationship was far more decentralized because it all rested on gold and government ability to finance itself and finance the stupid things that it does was severely compromised by the fact that it couldn't just print gold. And so, if we had something like this, I wonder, do you think, if we, let's say, we had the political and economic institutions of the year 1908, if we had them in 2008, would Satoshi have even created Bitcoin? It's an interesting question. Would all of the people that have worked on Bitcoin since then have been as interested and as involved in working on Bitcoin if we had been living under the international gold standard of 1908 in 2008? It's a very interesting question, you know, ask yourself um, maybe about your own individual motivations for being into Bitcoin and whether, you know, how many people here today would be here if the world didn't have many of these problems that it has today, but it didn't have in 1908. Um, would there be such, and I think more, more accurately or more specifically to the, um, to the topic of today's uh, uh, talk, Specifically, would there be as much of an incentive to innovate to save Bitcoin and to prevent Bitcoin from being intact? Would there be so much incentive to you know, run your own node, um, you know, make sure that you run the software, that you know your own software and so on? It's, and you know, innovating all these ways to get around government controls. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think it's a question well worth considering. And I think it helps us understand one um, other failure mode, in a sense, of Bitcoin, which isn't discussed enough, in my opinion, which is the failure that comes from the failure of uh, Bitcoin on a free market to compete with other forms of money. And the thing is, 
Um, currently, Bitcoin thrives because the market for money is, in a sense, um, highly limited. You can't move money across international borders because you have to move it across central banks, and they offer a monopoly to only a few specific correspondent banks. So it's, um, we have a highly um, inefficient global monetary system. It's, it is effectively um, backward, a backward system compared to the system that we had back in um, the 19th century. Because at least in the 19th century, you know, all of the world functioned on the same currency. It was one international monetary standard, and everybody in the world used gold. Whereas today, you know, you have to essentially barter with people who live on another side of a magic line in the sand. You can't just perform trade with them using money. You have to buy another good, which is their money first, and then buy theirs. So. In this kind of environment, Bitcoin thrives because this kind of environment benefits from having a money like Bitcoin that can get around government controls. But the question is, would it thrive without government controls? In a completely free market, if government wasn't actually messing with gold, you know, we could build um, all of the digital payment solutions that we want on top of physical gold. And without the gold having to move, that could happen. You know, you could have all the privacy you want if government wasn't um, interfering. You could have private companies building gold payments, settling in gold, and keeping your data private. Um, you can build all of these things on top of gold, and the limitation, in my opinion, is not technical. It's not, uh, it's not about the movement of gold. The limitation is political. The limitation is simply that government wouldn't let it happen. And so... Um, it's, it's an interesting question to imagine what would the free market really choose between gold and Bitcoin. If we had a completely free market and we had no choice, uh, we had complete choice, you know, there was no government control, would go Bitcoin's value proposition really win in that kind of situation over uh, gold? And I think it's a, it's, it's a useful thought experiment to think about. Um, the case for gold ultimately goes down to liquidity. It's the same reason that we like to use to mock the shitcoins. Well, I'm here to use it against Bitcoin today. In a sense, gold has much, 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 much higher liquidity than Bitcoin. And so, if you were to think about it, in, imagine a situation today in which you have a completely free market in money, and Bitcoiners uh, and people are free to choose whichever kind of money that they want to choose. What are they more likely to choose? Well, they're likely to choose the thing that just helps them get along and eat, basically. People are not going to be very ideological in a situation like that. They just need to use the, choose the thing that is the most convenient. And given that the size of the liquidity of uh, gold is far larger than Bitcoin, given that the number of people that own gold is far larger than Bitcoin, it's far more likely that that liquidity will beget more liquidity, that people will sell other monies for gold and more liquidity will move toward gold because it has the highest liquidity. So in that sense, you know, it could be that Bitcoin's, um, gold's giant liquidity edge might be enough. Of course, there's also the 6,000 year first mover advantage. It's physical, it's intuitive. You don't have to worry about code and private keys and all of those things has tradition going for it, you know, millions of Indian and Chinese and Muslim brides all over the world only get married with gold and with people get born, they're gifted gold. It's kind of a useful killer app for a, you know, store of value to have that. And essentially its physicality is really only a disadvantage politically. It's not much of a disadvantage operationally. We, the free market can use gold as money and we'll find technologies to make it a problem, to make it usable. But, you know, if only the government would let us. But of course, you know, the case for Bitcoin is the government is not going to let us. And that's precisely the point. And that's why we Bitcoin. So ultimately what it comes down to is that the cost of running a full node for Bitcoin is far cheaper than gold. And that really helps me um, communicate or, 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 or understand Bitcoin's value propositions. To just compare what it would take to be able to s build a central bank that is able to settle internationally in gold versus a central bank that's able to do, or a bank that is able to do this with a Bitcoin. It's far, far lower as a cost. And it's very cheap to be able to settle uh, payments globally. And it's uh, cheaper to verify, you know, with gold you have to assay the bars and that can be expensive and, you know, they keep getting better at uh, cheating them. And then, of course, the other killer uh, edge that Bitcoin has uh, 
is that it has a far lower supply, supply growth rate than, Bitcoin, than gold. Eventually, Bitcoin gets to a 0% uh, supply growth rate, which you know, means that there's the, the dynamic that I mentioned in my book of the irresponsiveness, irresponsiveness of the Bitcoin uh, demand to supply, that continues. And that would suggest that Bitcoin would likely continue to appreciate more and more over time and is used in a speculative manner. Whether that is enough to overcome the liquidity question is not entirely clear because without government manipulation of money, without government restrictions on the movement of money in a free market of money, you know, the whole uncensorable payment value proposition of Bitcoin, not such a big deal anymore. And that's really the question. So in a sense, the more we move toward a uh, free market system, the more that Bitcoin's uncensorable payment edge is eroded and then its edge goes back to the edge to the cost of running a full node which of course is related because that's ultimately what protects bitcoin from uh, government attack and that's why it matters so much so this makes me think that one way of understanding how this attack functions or how this attack could succeed is that the longer we continue with this kind of monetary policy where people have in their memory um, in their recent memory, most people in the world have experienced some form of hyperinflation or very high inflation. The more that we continue with this world with all this constant financial crises and um, economic crises that happen, the more that this continues, the more Bitcoin can grow its liquidity. And the more Bitcoin can grow its liquidity, the better of a chance it has to compete against gold in a free market eventually. And so, the good news, basically, is that the longer we stay in this kind of 20th century monetary policy around government control of money, the more time Bitcoin has to build larger and larger liquidity, the more times it can grow in order to be able to um, become more of a monetary asset. And so, in a sense, we can see that if, mo if monetary policy improves a lot, if you know, we get a massive improvement in monetary policy, if we get, um, if we, you know, all of, uh, all of the restrictions on the movement of money, if they're released and if there's less inflation, if there are no more Venezuelas, no more Zimbabwe's, if people don't have a problem with spending their money abroad and um, all of these issues become less and less um, problematic, you would imagine that Bitcoin would be under threat from the reduction in the economic incentive for people to use it or uh, want to transact in it or want to protect it or to innovate for it. On the other hand, there is also the other kind of danger of, in the case of, you know, we get a complete hyperinflationary scenario and then people have a free choice in money, then that is also a bit of a threat for Bitcoin because in that situation, maybe gold's liquidity is far more uh, important as an edge than Bitcoin's um, uh, uh, edge, which is eroded because it's, we no longer care about um, uncensorable payments. So, the, the, the bad news, I think, in this is that I think if you think about it this way, you know, we can, we, when we generally like to think that um, Bitcoin is government resistant, you know, and I think there are very good reasons to understand why it is like that, and of course it's true, but however, Bitcoin, I think, is kind of dependent on government in spite of its resistance to it, because it depends on government for the incentive for people to use it. You know, Bitcoin requires government to continue to do stupid things in order for people to want to use Bitcoin. And I know I'm scared some of you, but the good news is you don't have anything to worry about. We're counting on governments to do stupid things. Everything is under control. Everything's going according to plan. They're going to continue with this. <laughs> and... <laughs> and essentially, you know, they're... They're going to, you know, they don't run terrible monetary policy just because um, they want to advertise Bitcoin, although probably Bitstein might disagree. He thinks they're doing it because they're closet maximalists. But I think they generally do it because they benefit from it. But they're kind of doing us a favor because that's ultimately the only advertisement that Bitcoin needs. And that's what continues uh, to keep Bitcoin going. And so, in a sense, the continuation of the status quo, as long as monetary policy continues, uh, it's bad enough that we don't have a free market choice and uh, it's not good enough for people to want to get out of, uh, for people to not think that they need to get out of the mainstream uh, fiat monetary system. Uh, 
If it's not good enough and if it's not bad enough, then essentially the status quo continues to favor Bitcoin. Governments continue to subsidize and support Bitcoin. And finally, another thing that governments continue to support and subsidize is my website, safeitdean.com. And I'm going to shill you my website right now because just like governments continue to support Bitcoin by um, supporting bad monetary and banking policies, they support by my website by continuing to teach you bad economics in your university and making your university, wherever you are in the world, not teach proper Austrian economics, therefore forcing you to turn to my website, safedean.com, if you want to turn, if you want to learn about Austrian economics. So I'm offering now online courses, accepting Bitcoin only as well, and um, it's uh, also my book is out in uh, eight languages now, and it will soon be out in another uh, five languages. And if anybody is in the region, uh, on Tuesday we have uh, the release in uh, Helsinki for the Finnish translation of the book. Thank you very much.